I want to pick up where we left off yesterday by, uh, let me restate the, the title of this series, the title of our Norton Lectures are uh, thus, if you can't beat them, paraphrase them. Contemporary philosophy imitates Christian theology. And I think that if we're going to engage with people um, of a secular mindset, and I said this yesterday on Twitter, and uh, one of my friends, David Dark, said, I'm not sure that I recognize any such thing as a secular person. And I agree with that. Uh, I think that human beings are, um, as uh, uh, in a Calvinist mindset would put it, homo religiosus. We all have those, uh, we, we have this heart of assent. We, uh, human beings long for transcendence. That's what we're going to be talking about today. But we do have to take people at their word, word when they call themselves atheists and secularists. I think actually I, I threw back on him a Derrida quote. To take someone at their word is the act of faith par excellence. So I think what we have to do increasingly if we're going to do evangelism well in our society is to develop an imaginative sympathy with people who are coming from alien planets. And uh, sometimes it does feel like intergalactic travel. And uh, so somewhere along the line, one of the monikers that uh, someone gave to me was intergalactic keeper of souls. Because it does feel like sometimes we're traveling from planet to planet trying to understand one another in contemporary culture. To that end, I, uh, here is something that sits on my desk uh, at King's College, it's a Nietzsche plush toy. And uh, he sits there right along with my icons and my um, uh, St. Mary's Church in Wittenberg um, uh, painting of uh, Luther preaching to his congregation. I keep Nietzsche on my desk for this reason. Imaginatively, I keep hoping I'm going to win him over. Okay. And I think that that's what we ought to be trying to do. No one is ever too far gone. No one is ever too far lost. And what I want to portray in these lectures is that there is a new season of interest from atheist, secularist philosophers in the riches of the Christian theological tradition. And uh, unwittingly, maybe even, they wind up becoming magpies and. uh uh, you know, Augustine said that we, we, raid, we raid the Egyptians of their treasures. Well, it's actually kind of now turning the other way, where they're, uh, with the, where they're raiding ours. So, what I wanted to do to develop this imaginative sympathy of the way in which uh, our culture and our generation thinks is to show you a little uh, animated clip from a TED Talk by uh, a, a British genius in his own right, John Lloyd, and uh, I, I want to use it as a frame to get into our conversation about our second philosopher today, Peter Sloterdijk. And by the way, uh, Mark asked for me to spell these obscure European names. Sloterdijk is spelled S-L-O-T-R-D-I-J-K. Peter Sloterdijk. But Consider, consider uh, John Lloyd, and this is a, a fun little trip. Get you into the imaginative mode here. Ignosticism. As I explained yesterday at, at the top of my remarks, I think that we've shifted ground from kind of the uh, worn out debate between the so-called new atheists and traditional atheism, I don't think that's where the debate is anymore. I think that it's much more moved in a kind of John Lloyd direction of saying, well, we can't really know that much. We're in such awe of the universe and how little a capacity that we have to know. Where we wind up landing the plane is um, we need to figure out why are we here, and then what do we do about it? So everything has kind of shifted in um, post-post-Christian secular philosophy to a consideration of how do we live our lives, and uh, what do we do? And uh, that is uh, something that was uh, uh, 
exacerbated and made more poignant by uh, the, the writing of Nietzsche who continues to be this sort of prophetic figure there uh, in, in the latter half of the 19th century, theorists like Sloterdijk and like uh, Miyasu and like Zizek, they keep going back to Nietzsche as a source of inspiration because he was talking about a lot of these things. And uh, famously, Nietzsche said that uh, where, where everyone else sees transcendent meaning, I see only what is human, all too human. So we are left alone, we are simply human on the planet, and uh, where do we go from here? How do we live in light of this? It's a subject that Nietzsche took up in his later career before he descended into uh, insanity after he collapsed in uh, Turin. So these are the themes that are uh, uh, taken up by Peter Sloterdijk. Now, who is Peter Sloterdijk? He is a name that may not be familiar to you, but he would be uh, a name that is familiar to kind of the average person on the street in Germany. He has a very popular television talk show. He is a uh, professor of uh, philosophy at Karlsruhe. Uh, Los Angeles uh, Review of Books recently called him the most erudite man living on the planet. That's a pretty nice title. He gained notoriety in 1983 for a book that he wrote, which was kind of a, a vamp on Kant's critique of pure reason. It was called The Critique of Cynical Reason. So he said, where do we go after this kind of post-rational uh, society that we live in? Well, he goes back to the original cynic, Diogenes the cynic. He said, we ought to live like Diogenes the cynic. We ought to re-inhabit uh, a bodily presence in the world in light of the fact that we can't really know as much as we once thought we did. And so there's kind of a humility that he sees in cynicism. Now, if you know uh, anything about some of the stories of Diogenes the Cynic, um, and Sloterdijk actually calls this uh, kinicism because he, he wants to get away from just cynic, which is kind of like this snarky uh, mentality, but more this kind of joyful embrace of our embodiedness. This is what he's going for. So Diogenes the cynic famously uh, walked around um, uh, the streets of Athens with a lit candle in broad daylight, and he'd go up to people's faces, and he'd shine the candle in their face, and they'd say, what are you doing? He's like, I'm looking for an honest man. And then he would uh, famously, um, <clears throat> you know, eat out of a bowl. He only had one possession, which was a bowl. He was a, the original minimalist. And then he saw a child, you know, scoop down and drink water out of their hands, at which point he got rid of the bowl. The most famous uh, uh, story from uh, Diogenes the Cynic's life was when uh, he was uh, uh, given audience, or actually Alexander the Great came to him. Diogenes the Cynic did not rise from his place. He stayed seated on the ground, and, and uh, he spoke, uh, Alexander the Great wanted audience with Diogenes for uh, quite some time. And then at the very end, Alexander, very impressed with, uh, with Diogenes, said, uh, whatever Diogenes the cynic wants, I will give to him. What would you want? And Diogenes said, could you take two steps to the right? You're blocking the sunlight. So that's what, you know, that in 1983, that's where Slaughter Dyke was, that kind of joyful embrace of just kind of everyday realities. But he's moved past that, and he's written this trilogy. Now, you know, everybody loves to write a trilogy. I want to write a trilogy. Mark, let's write a trilogy. Yeah, yeah. Don't you think we ought to have our own trilogy? Okay, good. He, he wrote this trilogy called Spheres, and uh, two out of the three have now appeared in English. Um, and, and you might be surprised by the titles of these books. The first one is called Bubbles, and the second one is called You Must Change Your Life. Now, I, I realize that that kind of sounds like something that Joel Osteen would write. Bubbles and You Must Change Your Life. But it's actually a little more uh, serious than that. In, in Bubbles, what Slaughterdyke says is that actually admits what the new atheists won't admit, which is that the demise of religion in our time has created a toxic environment for the West. 
And he says that what, what's happened with the demise of religion is that it has created a greenhouse effect because people only do well in an environment in which they have a rich matrix of symbols and meanings and liturgies and um, beliefs. So now the atmosphere, when that's sucked out by kind of radical atheism and leftism and, and Marxism, when that's sucked out of the atmosphere, everything starts to heat up when that oxygen supply of meaning is gone. And so he says, the whole earth is melting down intellectually, so to speak. And so what do we do? Well, what did the New South do? We have to figure out a way to find central air conditioning. We have to air condition ourselves from the fact that the um, earth is melting down. So uh, if each of us needs to become a self-contained air conditioning unit, where do you go to kind of remind yourself what it's like to breathe in deep and, and feel comfortable? Well, in bubbles where Slaughter Dyke goes, for themes to uplift the soul is he goes back to Christian art and he goes back to Christian themes and, and symbols. So Adam Hirsch, writing in the New Republic about Slaughter Dyke says, quote, it's no coincidence that many of these examples come from the iconography of Christianity since religion has been mankind's best generator of spheres. What Slaughter Dyke hopes to do is to re retrieve religion's power to create intimacy while shearing it of its untenable dogmas. It will be advantageous, quoting from Slaughter Dyke, for the free spirit to emancipate itself from the anti-Christian affect of recent centuries as a tenseness that is no longer necessary. Anyone seeking to reconstruct basic communal and communitary experiences needs to be free of anti-religious reflexes. So he says this kind of itchy, anything that's religious, kind of uh, hitchens, you know, religion poises any, any, everything, you know, uh, uh, Schlatter Dyke's like, you know, Don Henley from the Eagles, get over it, okay? Just get over it already. Actually, these guys are doing a lot better than we are, so shut up. So he goes back to these kinds of things, and he, he draws inspiration from them, particularly themes like the Trinitarian doctrine of perichoresis and other things, as Hirsch notes in The New Republic. But it is not until he uh, published You Must Change Your Life, a title that he borrowed from a uh, um, uh, Rilke poem, that he really gets underway with his proposal. What's needed in our time, he says, is a new asceticism, kind of a new athletic monasticism in which we inhabit new liturgies that keep us competitive and strong in the world that can no longer look to religion for answers. So he employs a phrase from Nietzsche in the genealogy of morals called, uh, we, we need to uh, create an ascetic planet. In this world, after the death of God, we need to figure out ways to make the, the, the human spirit go vertical without just keeping, you know, descending to the level of, the, uh, of you know, what Thomas Hobbes said life was, nasty, brutish, and short. How do you get beyond that? So, Nietzsche is his prophet, Sloterdijk, and uh, he says that the Key debate in our time is not atheist, Christian theism versus atheism, but it's a debate versus sick and healthy asceticisms. So it is who can come up with the best ascetic model, the best liturgies for human flourishing in our time. He goes to a kind of an athletic competition type model. Now, you know, I don't know if he ever read C.T. Studd, but uh, this would be kind of his arch enemy, this kind of Christian athleticism of stud. So Nietzsche writes this in the Genealogy of Morals, quote, the ascetic or the priestly sick type treats life as a wrong path on which one must walk backwards till one comes to the place where it starts, or he treats life as an error which one may, nay, must refute by action, for he demands what he should be 
in what he follows. He enforces where he can his valuation of existence. What does this mean? Such a monstrous valuation is not an exceptional care or curiosity reported in human history. It is one of the broadest and longest facts that exists. Reading from the vantage point of the distant star, the capital letters of our earthly life would perchance lead to the conclusion that the earth was truly an ascetic planet, a den of discontented, arrogant, and repulsive creatures who never got rid of that deep disgust of themselves, of the world, of all life, and did themselves uh, as much hurt as possible out of pleasure in hurting themselves, presumably their one and only pleasure. So what's Nietzsche saying there? He says, we have had ascetics in the past. They were uh, pastors and priests and monks. But their asceticism is just to say a big no to life, okay? The things that truly make us happy and make us, we have to deny ourselves, we have to flagellate ourselves, you know, and we just celebrated Reformation Day. You think about the, what Luther went through um, before he found the doctrine of justification by faith. Nietzsche, an another German who... Uh, ironically hated Germany, uh, s uh, sensed that tension too. But he says we need to move away from this priestly sick mentality where we have to deny everything related to our embodiedness and our life and everything. And uh, actually that is true. Later on in life, Nietzsche kind of gives up on the idea of coming up with some sort of new metaphysics. Um, he's just run into a dead end there, really. He's done a great job at critique, uh, many think, but he's trying to come up with a positive proposal. So in the, in the non-totally crazy parts of his autobiography, Ecce Homo, what is he talking about most of the time? It's kind of like a cookbook, actually. I mean, when you read Ecce Homo, he's talking about the, the fact that Germans don't know how to uh, have a healthy diet. So here's a, here's a great... Uh, quote. He says, that the, the chief most problem with Germany that will lead to cultural disaster is, quote, in sadly disordered intestines, unquote. Now, I mean, uh, Martin Luther would have said a hearty amen to that as well, because if you read any of uh, Luther's correspondence, or Calvin's for that matter, they're constantly talking about sadly disordered intestines. So uh, Nietzsche goes on here, quote, as to German cookery in general... What has it not got on its conscience? Soup before the meal? Meat boiled to shreds? Vegetables cooked with fat and flour? The degeneration of pastries into paperweights? He sees the apocalypse coming through what's on the you know, general family table in Germany. And so what does Nietzsche say? He himself is very ill. Um, people think they know why, but I think there's recent research indicating that they may not know what they're talking about. But what does Nietzsche do? He goes to Sils Maria. He starts walking in the Alps. Get outdoors. Inhabit the world. Uh, come up with a diet that makes you competitive and, and healthy. Now, Schlotterdijk's reading all of this, and he says, here's where Nietzsche is right. He is right that we have to come up with something that lifts the soul vertically. But here's where Nietzsche is wrong. He spends way too much energy and time beating up on the Christians. Uh, and this is energy wasted when he could have been coming up with a, uh, you know, a more effective uh, cultural proposal. So um, he says, uh, Nietzsche got us on the right track, but he didn't really uh, uh, ultimately give us anything positive to, uh, to help us become these kind of new athletic monks in a, in a secular environment. So how do you do that? Well, what Schlotterdijk says in, in, in you must change your life. And by the way, this book just appeared in English, you know, uh, o over the summer. Uh, is that he says something very reminiscent to what uh, look, I, I quoted Lacan as saying yesterday. He says, you know, we live in a world in which we talk about history of religion school. Kind of Ernst Trelch, history of religion school. He says, this is bunk. There are no religions. Uh, and, and proof that their history of religions school is just 
stupid is that Scientology is considered a religion. It's like that's proof enough that there is no such thing as plural religions. If that's what it means, let's just forget. Let's just stop using the term religions. But the, the one religion which he does say is, here's the true one, here's the one that actually takes us somewhere, is once again uh, Christianity. So um, he says what's great about Christianity is that Christianity is a, um, a theology of su a supply. He understands what Christianity actually is, and here's where I'm going to get my Carl Henry on. He says that Christianity at its base is a theology of revelation. It gives human beings something they couldn't get themselves. It supplies them with what God wants to show. I'm going to show you something. And here, Schlatter Dyke engages with Karl Barth. And he says, now, this is why Karl Barth was the greatest thinker in the West since Friedrich Nietzsche, because he got this, this notion of uh, we, we, we live in, a, in, a, in an age which is demanding, you know, a new rehabilitation of the soul. And Bart was coming in with this theology of supply, this, you know, dialectical uh, revelation from God coming at a tangent. But what, what Schlotterdijk says that uh, neither Nietzsche now nor Bart does is to really give us a programmatic kind of handbook on how, um, how to live. So what do we do? Well, um, in the epigram to his programmatic part of his book, and by the way, for those of you that have taken philosophy courses, you're always asking, like we do in preaching classes, you know, where's the application to this? How do I apply this? How do I preach this? Well, I mean, Schlotterdijk does that. I mean, in this book, here you get this, you know, very esoteric philosopher who's going to, like, come up with some programmatic ideas about the way forward. Now, you, we may not think he succeeds, but he's trying to do it. So what does he ask us to do? In an epigram from the Austrian poet uh, Ingeborg Bachmann, at the beginning of his programmatic section, he asks us to jump through the burning hoop that is the world. That's what we have to do. The world's melting down, and so what we have to do is take the great risk of jumping through the hoop with a new kind of asceticism. And where does he draw inspiration? Okay, now for a couple hundred pages, uh, what he's doing is he's drawing from his inspiration comes from Christian sources. So what does he propose? This is an, an exhaustive list, but it's illustrative. He... Um, he proposes that we form secular monastic communities that inspire fitness and the greatness of individuals. Um, and one of the things that he points to here is, the, is kind of the, the magnificent tradition of monasteries taking people from heathen and pagan uh, backgrounds and building these great communities of, of human uh, uh, flourishing. And um, he, he calls out all the critics of the medieval period and of the church and, you know, who say, oh, you know, monasticism uh, and, and kind of the, the priests and the, and the pastors and the Christianese theologians and leaders, what did they really contribute to the world, you know, and they, you know, like, like Nietzsche was doing. And what Schlotterdijk says, a lot these people did a lot. And not only this, but one of the things he loves, he's like, they built, have you seen these monasteries? They're built at the top of mountains. They ascended mountains and built awesome stuff there. What have you done for me lately, secularists? I mean, that's kind of what Slaughter Dyke is saying here. So he says, we need to have those kinds of uh, uh, communities. Now, I, I don't know if these would be celibate uh, communities. He doesn't go into that. Uh, second thing that he talks about, um, is, is virtue ethics. He says we need a new uh, series of habitual practices, day-to-day -day routines that will help air condition our souls. And so what are his inspirations here? He goes back to Thomas Aquinas, and he's, uh, Aristotle and Aquinas, and he says we need to reread these texts because they knew how to teach people. They had a pedagogy that worked. And we don't have a pedagogy. It's kind of like what Alain de Botton was saying yesterday in the, the formation of this, these schools of life in, in Great Britain. Now, third thing he says we need to do. We need to pe teach people to face 
uh, death with bravery. So, of all the illustrations that he could go to that would say, how do we, what is the model for facing death with bravery? Here again, he goes to Christ on the cross, and he says, what figure of the ancient world, while being crucified, would say, it is finished, mission accomplished, and overcoming it through a a, a bodily resurrection. Now, listen to this. Here's a quote. He admires the scriptural messianic athletic statement of achievement on the cross. The acrobatic revolution of Christianity does not end with the conquest of death's passion being demonstrated on the cross. So here he diverges from Zizek that we saw yesterday. The triumph of ability over non-ability takes place between Good Friday and Easter morning. The most pathos-laden of all time spent in this time, the slain Jesus, carried out of the most unheard of fact, that he descends into hell. He walks through the underworld on tiptoe with his resurrection on the third day. Anti-gravitation celebrates its greatest victory. It is as if Christ... The first among God's acrobats has gotten a hold of a vertical rope that has opened up the way for him and his followers to absolutely vertical, previously closed, or only sensed mythically possibilities. So, here again, kind of the takeaway, Christianity has the better story. A fourth thing, he points to the Christianity's success in getting this notion of uh, getting away from the herd mentality, the succession of the self from the crowd. And so he's quoting biblical texts here. Matthew 10, 37. Anyone who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Step out and become a disciple. Mark 10, 28 through 30. Peter said, we've left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied. No one who's left home or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will receive a hundred times as much. So Slaughterdyke goes back to the text of scripture. He goes back to Kierkegaard. We need to teach people how to be independent uh, and self-directed. So then he goes in a fifth thing. He talks about we need to teach people goal-directed, goal-directedness. What is his illustration for this? St. Paul, 1 Corinthians 9, 26 Quote, what early Christianity meant by faith was initially nothing other than running ahead and clinging to an idea whose attainability was still uncertain. This is precisely what Paul is referring to in his exhortation to the Corinthians in his first letter. Follow my example as I follow Christ. The speaker's imitation worthiness lies here not in the successes he has achieved, but rather in his movedness by the goal. Whoever imitates such an imitator of Christ is running behind a runner. So he's saying to his secular friends, who is out there running? Who, are, who do we have who's out there running? A sixth thing, we need to teach people the doctrine of repentance, metanoia. We need to get them to change their life, the way they've been doing things. By the way, uh, this is one of the great, uh, I think, uh, failings of this generation. Um, don't judge me, but I was listening to NPR a couple weeks ago, and um, there was an interview with a, a, a band that I, I kind of like called Dale Earnhardt Jr. Jr. Any uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Jr. fans out there? Um, okay, okay, you, you like Dale Earnhardt? Okay, good. Um, but they were saying, well, what is this record about? And they said, well, this record is about our generation. Okay, now, in the 60s, you know, when you had Pete Townsend uh, you know, talking about my generation, it was kind of exhilaration, like, oh, talking about my gen." Well, this is not Dale Earnhardt Jr., Jr. They think that their generation is kind of lame. So they said, the interviewer said, what, what, is the, what is characteristic of your generation? And they said, failure to launch. Failure to launch is the story of our generation. We're the generation that can't seem to do what our parents' generation did. We're the generation that can't decide what their career is, and we're in our early 30s. 
we're the career that where our, our parents and our grandparents, they were owning houses by this point, and they were having kids, and they were like acting like grown-ups. We're still kind of flopping around saying, eh. It's like, that's... That's a, well, I mean, this is kind of what I, you know, maybe Slaughter Dyke should start listening to Dale or her, Earnhardt Jr. Jr. and this notion of taking, uh, taking risks and opportunities. Again, this is something that he thinks was done better by Christians. You have these conversion stories. You have people turning their back on their former life and embracing something new and moving toward a goal. Um, then he thinks we need a, a reformation of schools, and what is his, um, you know, what what is his model for the reformation of schools? He's not going to modern education theory and John Dewey. He finds no succor, so to speak, in John Dewey. Who does he go to? John Amos Comenius. He goes to the, you know, he goes to the kind of, you know, Moravian Brethren model as like this is these, these that's what we need to go back to. Okay, so time and again, Slaughter Dyke seems to be cheering on his secular audience by cajoling them and saying, come on guys, these Christians have been brilliant at these kinds of uh, uh, models of self-discipline and athleticism and asceticism. Now, what can we say to these things? Um, Going back to the John Lloyd video at the very beginning, I do think that we're at a moment in time in which people are saying, what do we do? How do we live our lives? What actually is the best platform for human flourishing? And it is a competition. Make no mistake about it. We are involved in a great global um, competition in that sense. And I think it's very interesting that you have someone like a Peter Schlauterdijk asking us to go back to kind of liturgical, a liturgical, ascetic way of life. At the same time, we have this revival, so to speak, or this uh, new interest in evangelical circles in all things liturgical and ascetic, you know, and all the... Yeah, the, the disciplines and stuff. Now, here's my question. I'm going to kind of like leave this dangling out here and not resolve it. So I'll just kind of be a philosopher for this moment. So we have all, you know, we have this kind of wave of new books, you know, and new and old books. But, you know, the kind of the hot thing that a lot of kids, Christian college campus kids are reading is like Hans Urs von Balthasar and imagination, and, and Owen Barfield, and uh, Alexander Schmemann, you know, orthodox writers. And then we have evangelicals like, you know, uh, uh, Jamie uh, Smith and his books, in, uh, Desiring the Kingdom and Imagining the Kingdom, that are about new forms of liturgical life. Bruce Ellis Benson, the philosopher uh, at Wheaton, lit Liturgy as a Way of Life. Um, now, uh, we have to be able to demonstrate that that way of life is actually uh, as competitive as Slaughterdyke thinks that it is. And maybe it's a bridge of evangelistic um, conversation. But here is what is almost certainly the case in all of this. Human beings long for transcendence, and I think we do live in a world. We saw it yesterday with Zizek. We saw, we're seeing it now with Slaughter Dyke, in which there's this kind of sentimental <laughs> uh, longing for uh, that, that past of a, um, a, a universe in which everything fits, and there's a concrete uh, ethic of how to uh, live one's life. And even Nietzsche himself was never able to surmount his, his piety and love for Christian art and the Christian calendar. Uh, now, here's something that you might not have ever heard before, but Nietzsche loved Christmas. He loved everything about Christmas. He loved the infancy narrative. He loved singing uh, 
the hymns, the, the Christmas hymns. He loved the tree and the decorations and, and, and all of that. And there's a fantastic uh, new quasi-memoir um, and biography of, of, um, of Nietzsche by Christoph Mikalski, the late Christoph Mikalski, called The Flame of Eternity. And he says that uh, over and over again, what, what really could soothe Nietzsche's tortured soul were things like Bach's St. Matthew's Passion and Raphael's tra Transfiguration. These were the things that air-conditioned Nietzsche's soul. Take note. Um, so I think we have an opportunity here um, to, to step into that environment um, and, and actually answer both Wittgenstein's question that we saw up front, or statement, it wasn't a question. Wittgenstein didn't really ask questions, he made statements. Um, uh, address Wittgenstein's statement. Um, I am not sure what we are here for, but I'm pretty sure it is not to have a good time. Okay, now that is Nietzsche's critique of the church. And I think that we're at our best where we display to the world this loving, strong, athletic, gospel-oriented community where they look at it and they're like, what's inside? They really look like they're having a good time. And secondly, to follow up on Auden, what do we do? We know what to do. We have a text of scripture. We don't need to go back to zero. We don't need to invent something new. Uh, we have the text of the scripture and we have um, all this, this heavenly host, these great saints who have gone before us. So we need to read biographies, okay? Go, go read the biographies of these great Christian heroes and look at how they lived and incorporate their practices into uh, your life and, and our lives. And I'll give you two recommendations there just briefly as I close. Uh, uh, go get uh, the, the uh, Tom Nettles' uh, new biography that, that he's written. You can do that, okay? Start reading biographies. And uh, I would also say that there's a, uh, a new book by my friend Paul House coming out on uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's uh, community in Finkenwalde with his uh, seminary students. And what Paul House rightly points out is that when we read Life Together, it was originally written for a seminary. It was written for theological education. How do we live together in community so that when we go out and pastor and lead churches, we can show a truly healthy, not sick, not a weak, but a flourishing Christian community? Thank you so much.